For a million years, the campfire was our only source of nighttime light, and it may also have kept predators away from our vulnerable ancestors who were sleeping on the ground of the African savanna. Throughout 10,000 years of civilization, a single candle provided indoor, nighttime lighting. The wealthy of us were distinguished by lighting a dozen candles. And then, in the year 1810, oil lamps began to be used that were as bright as tin candles. And by 1830, many city homes had a lamp or two. The Standard Oil Company began producing this type of oil after the Civil War ended in 1865. Standard Oil quickly monopolized the distillation plants in order to control the supply side of supply and demand, and thus obtained large profits. Continuing with the arrival of the automobile, Standard Oil strived to control much of the gasoline refining industry. Still today, the supply of gas can be similarly limited in the U.S. by having too few distillation plants. On the outskirts of Baltimore in 1821, one company built a coal distillation plant to produce gas that was piped to nearby homes and businesses so that they could burn the gas for lighting. Since the installation and usage of gas in a home cost as much as the average person's annual wage, not many persons chose to purchase this newfangled convenience. By 1830, gas lighting was available in Boston, New York City, and in Philadelphia, where there were only 700 customers by 1836. For 10,000 years, village and city residents were forced to stumble around in the dark. When gas and street lighting was developed, nightlife began to be effortless and carefree for the first time ever. The earliest paint manufacturing shop in New England was opened in Boston in 1700 by Thomas Child. He supplied paint to those Boston homes that could afford the luxury. In 1784, Sam Wetherill began making paint by grinding lead and mixing it with oil and pigments. In the 1840s, his sons built a paint factory. For the first time, paint was cheap enough that our wooden homes were commonly being painted. The Wetherill business was closed in 1933, during the Great Depression. In 1866, Henry Sherwin and Edward Williams formed the Sherwin-Williams Company, which still exists today. In the year 1798, Eli Whitney built a firearms factory, having 10 apprentices Eli put into practice the European idea of making identical and interchangeable parts. When a part broke, it could be replaced without having to replace the entire device. In 1794, Eli Whitney invented his cotton gin that separates cotton fibers from seeds. Here is an early mechanized version. And this is a modern version of the device. In the years 1790 through 1835, the cotton production in the southern United States increased 100 fold, from 10,000 to 1 million bales, each weighing 500 pounds or 200 kilograms. Half was being exported to Europe. The demand for cotton and the production of cotton quickly increased in unison until cotton had become the world's main commodity. England's textile factories were purchasing, processing, and selling huge amounts of cotton, and within a few decades, New England's factories were also. In the northern U.S., the growth in cotton production was accompanied by a growth in awareness that northern factories were processing slave labor cotton obtained from southern plantations. 
the Civil War was nearing. As factories began to make carpets, curtains, mirrors, and upholstered furniture, these things began to cost less so that more and more homes were able to afford them. Cheaply printed wallpaper begins to cover our walls. By 1830, 20% of a home had a carpet. In 1840, the invention of an inexpensive printing process, the lithograph, began to bring art to the walls of the common home. European and Chinese dishware began to have images printed onto them. These too started to appear in the average home. Only one house in ten had a watch before inexpensive watches were mass produced. Tunis says that the repeated breakdown kept local watch repairers busy. Mass-produced clocks began to be cheap enough that by 1830, two-thirds of rural craft shops had one. Tall clocks, or grandfather clocks, were believed to bring a certain distinction to a home. Mass-produced items are less expensive, but they are also less decorated and lose local craft styles and distinctions. For example, between 1800 and 1830, the number of chairs per household doubled, but their hand-carved hearts and crowns had been eliminated. Before industrialization, these household items were handcrafted and possessed only by wealthy families. Industrialization began and expanded by selling mass-produced versions of these objects to families of average, but not too poor, means. At first, very few persons worked in the factories. They were already working night and day at their farm and home. The lower the price of the factory made goods, the greater demand, the greater required level of production, and the greater number of persons needed to work in these factories. The earliest factory products were either being worn or were decorating our homes. At the time, there was much discussion about the increasing number of mirrors, curtains, and carpets in the home. Each region of the world has a unique culture and history. While industrialization was suited to the northeastern United States, the South remained agricultural. The most wealthy persons, who had the funds needed to build factories, had no interest in changing the system that they headed. Whether or not the region or nation begins to industrialize today similarly depends on many aspects of society. Just before the Civil War, the South's gross product ranked among the world's top ten, but was one-tenth as large as that of the northern United States. The South's manufacturing capacity was 15% of that of the North. Several decades later, as the South did begin to industrialize, some Northern factories were shut down and moved to the South where lower wages were paid. This continual movement of factories continues today as industrialists move factories every decade or so to the region of the world having the lowest wages of the moment. Licht explains that the process was more complex than the common phrase industrialization and urbanization can describe. The United States industrialized through a slow and geographical uneven process. The nation was becoming more urban while a commercial market emerged in which everything began to be bought and sold in search of profit. The adoption and spread of factories occurred in just one generation of time, but this industrialization occurred amidst the continued mix of every sort of economic activity known to human beings, including gathering and hunting, subsistence farming, tenant farming, commercial agriculture, fishing, lumbering, mining, crafting, apprenticeships, the bartering of goods and services, and slavery. In the year 1860, about 5% of U.S. slaves were working in southern factories. 
As had occurred since the origins of cities, some products were being made by families working at home. Entire mill villages were also set up using the outwork system in which family labor was done in the home. There were one industry factory towns. Each one mass produced a very narrow range of items at low cost. In the large cities, there were diverse and specialized manufacturing shops that produced smaller quantities of custom, handmade items while being careful not to make expensive versions of the low-cost items that the factories were making. The factories were located out in the country near a river that could power the mill. The earliest water-powered factories in the United States were built with the knowledge smuggled out of England. Factories were built as mechanical inventors teamed with wealthy investors. The early lack of labor to run machinery was soon succeeded by floods of immigrant labor. Factories did not move to the city until steam power allowed them to exist away from rivers. Licht explains that an ever-increasing quantity of products were manufactured as it was found that an ever-increasing number of persons could afford to buy them. This increased market activity pulled the nation's change to industrialization, urbanization, and to the commercial buying and selling of everything. The volumes of wages, purchases, sales, profit, and production go hand in hand, all rise and fall together. With the very first factory, factory sales and profit would increase if wages were increased because workers could then buy more factory made products. But the owner of each factory worried that the sales will go to someone else's factory and instead cared only to keep wages at his factory as low as possible. Still today, whenever wages are limited, so too will be purchases, sales, profit, and production. We learned that the hard way during the Great Depression, to have unemployment insurance that pays laid off workers enough money to continue making the purchases that keep factories in operation. It simultaneously serves as unemployment and factory production insurance. Most 17th century persons who transplanted their families to the New World colonies came from the middle class. European peasants could not afford the trip and wealthy people did not want to leave. The American colonies contained a smaller range in the economic class. Imagine plucking the middle 2% of people of your nation today and moving them to a new area to restart society. The people of the colonies had shed the European system of nobles, but after 1820 or so, they were beginning to be threatened with the subjugation by new economic nobles in the land of equals. Many in the United States were bothered by the rising importance of money and by the cold and uncontrollable business cycles. Since the time of the first cities and artisans, typically just 10% of us were involved in business and business mostly meant selling utensils and decorations to only the wealthiest of us. Business cycles were much less pronounced and they affected a smaller portion of us. Only the price of cereals mattered to most of us. The population as a whole was more affected by intermittent years of widespread disease or poor crop production. The European Americans had forgotten the social classes of their old countries. For example, a coach driver did not feel that he was of lower class than of his passengers, as was expected in Europe. One European traveler said that he could not comprehend the driver's view of his own social place. Other European travelers said they were not treated with the respect that they felt their station deserved, and that the U.S. workers were unwilling to be subservient. When special meals were requested, they instead received rancid bacon. 
workers would go out of their way to provide slow service just to let so-called uppity guests know that they were not impressed by their opinion of being of a more noble class. Larkin says that the uppity would receive the democratic rudeness that a presumptuous superiority seldom fails to experience. In the United States, by 1820, knee dips and bowing between adults were relics of the past, but children continued to be taught to show this respect to elders until 1840. British travelers said they had trouble telling who was who in the United States because social distinctions were less clearly spelled out. Persons were instead considered to be equals and would even be seen shaking hands with each other. Wigs were common in the English colonies. Tuna says that a person might make an annual contract with a barber for the upkeep and curling of a wig. People were nearly bald under their wig, so they wore turbans when they removed them at home. After the revolution, wigs began to be replaced with hats, which soon grew to be as tall as a person's head by the year 1820. President Lincoln wore such a hat. Politicians continued to wear traditional European wigs until about 1830. Andrew Jackson's presidency was celebrated as representing the common people. He even drank and danced on the table during his inauguration. He held meetings in the White House that were open to all citizens. But the land of social equals still showed a number of economic levels, including the largest urban merchants plantation owners, professionals, middle-sized farmers, storekeepers, artisans, smaller and hard-pressed common farmers, landless laborers, and slaves. Nylander explains that after 1840, some urban people stopped seeing live-in help as part of the family and instead began thinking that their hired help owed them due respect. Disappearing were the old ways of hired help being part of the family. In the past, hired help moved in with the family and traded their own labor for food, clothing, training, and shelter, attended church with the family, and went socializing with the family. This change did not occur in the countryside until after the year 1900. About 2% of the population of a series of European nations who were having war or economic downturns moved to the United States in search of factory jobs or farmland and to have a chance to beat the odds and live a good life. Many of us recent immigrants wrote to our families back in the old countries about the harsh life in the U.S. factories, but said that we also believed that we had a chance of doing well for the family. The letter might recommend that several other family members should make the move, but not John because he couldn't handle it. We would move around the world for the same reasons today and often find the same harsh conditions as we were forced to take the lowest paying jobs, as is occurring, for example, in the migration from farming villages to the big city factories of Asia and Latin America. From 1820 to 1860, there was little change of the standard in living for working class people because both wages and the cost of living rose together. Most were not able to improve their level of living even after working for a lifetime. Throughout these decades, there was an increasing separation between the quality of life of unskilled workers, skilled workers, employers, and professionals. The lower class had swelled and become a visible mass of glaring equality such as never before occurred in the colonies. The shoemaker William Hyten denounced the greed of those who sought profit from the labor of others. He said that we were all born equal and that democracy would be damaged by the growing concentration of wealth. He formed the first labor-based political party, the Working Men's Party of Philadelphia. He said that workers should benefit from their labors and have equal access to education. They should even control the government to guard against injustices being done to them by the wealthy. 
Hyten's party sought to promote the end of debtors' prison, a prohibition of license monopolies, legal protection for labor unions, to stop the use of prison labor contracts, a reorganization of the militia recruitment, the payment of wages in hard currency rather than in credits at the company store, better public service in poor neighborhoods, and free public schools so that all children could obtain knowledge. Other contributors to this debate included Fanny Wright, Robert Dale Owen, John Ferd, Seth Luther, and Thomas Skidmore. Union members criticized a society whose well-being was coming to be ruled by a supply and demand and by undue concentrations of wealth. Whenever Lowell Mill owners threatened to decrease wages or to increase workloads during the 1830s, the Lowell girls responded with work stoppages. For example, one-third of the girls walked off the job in 1836. Early unions supported strikes for decreased hours and for increased wages. A labor union is an association of people just as a corporation is an association of people. But court rulings went against labor associates and soon ruled that business corporations have the rights of persons. The earliest unions disappeared during the economic recessions of 1819 and 1836 as job losses resulted in the loss of members. It would be many years before unions would reappear and continue to fight for the eight-hour workday. One woman pointed out that while young men pondered the choice of future careers, a woman was forced to ponder only the career of her future husband. In many ways, we men treated women as property having no rights. Many of the world's men still do this. Many of us women referred to a girl's marriage as resigning her liberty. In 1840, there are increasing discussions of the injustice of constraining women's lives. Women are half of our human assets. We women had almost no legal property rights under the U.S. Constitution, said to be of equals. In fact, we didn't even have rights to our own children, in that ex-husbands always kept the children after a divorce. Lucy Stone refused to pay taxes since she was not represented in the government. In 1848, Elizabeth Cady Stanton wrote her Declaration of Sentiments in the fashion of Thomas Jefferson's Declaration of Independence, challenging the nation to be true to its founding documents. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men and women are created equal, that they are endowed by their Creator with certain inalienable rights that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. There were increased discussions of the injustice of slavery. In 1852, Harriet Beecher Stowe explained, as the factories of the northern United States were buying cotton grown and picked by us slaves in the southern United States, those northern factories were willingly participating in the enslavement of some of us human beings in the southern United States. Stowe made Northerners understand their own inhumane role in participating in Southern slavery. This helped generate a large increase in anti-slavery sentiment by the people in the North as they realized their own role in the enslavement of some of us human beings. When President Lincoln met Harriet, he commended her, allegedly saying that she was the lady who wrote the book which started the war. In its first seven years, one in 35 U.S. residents bought Harriet's book, Uncle Tom's Cabin, The Man That Was a Thing. When one of us slaves fought back, then the plantation owner would gather slaves from every nearby plantation and force all of us to watch that person being hung and killed. Similarly, modern-day dictators such as Saddam Hussein stay in power by periodically chopping off the heads of a few persons on Main Street because this keeps the rest of us in line. None of us gamble with our lives. 